You should see. All right, we're good to go. Uh, hello again, everyone. I'm Gail Iwamasa. I am the current chair of the VA section of uh, Division 18, which is Psychologist in Public Service. We are so thrilled uh, to present you with, I think, a very timely webinar today from two of my amazing colleagues in the VA. It is, you are not alone, BIPOC psychologists surviving discrimination in the workplace. And just wanna let you now draw your attention to the bottom toolbar on your screen. And uh, if you have comments, feel free to use, thank you. And um, if you look on the screen there too, if you have comments, please use the chat function. If you have uh, questions for either presenter, please post them in the Q&A uh, box. I will be monitoring both during the presentation and uh, Dr. Mesador will also be monitoring um, them as well. So with that said, let me take a couple minutes to introduce our fabulous speakers. I'll start with Dr. Inez Campo Verde. She is a Latinx psychologist at the VA Portland Healthcare System. She is the Associate Chief of Psychology. She is a National Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Consultant for VA Lead Senior Leadership. And she's Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Oregon Health Sciences University. Dr. Marie Mesador is a health behavior coordinator and psychologist at the Central Arkansas VA Healthcare System. She also is a national diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant for VA senior leadership and is a participant leader in APA's Leadership Institute for Women in Psychology. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our presenters. Take it away. Hi, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, as um, Dr. Iwamasa mentioned, my name is Dr. Mesador, and I'm going to be one of the presenters today, along with my colleague, Dr. Campaverdi. Our topic today is You're Not Alone, BIPOC Psychologists Surviving Racism and Discrimination in the Workplace. Um, we really wanted to have this um, presentation because we know that there are um, psychologists of color who are struggling or who have in the past and who haven't had a space or forum to um, discuss these issues or just even make it um, out in the open. Um, and so we hope it will be helpful um, to those of you who are BIPOC psychologists, as well as allies who are in attendance and who may be looking for ways to better support um, colleagues. So next slide, please. So our objectives today um, are listed on the left-hand side, but first there's a funny little cartoon um, that says, when was your last stress test? And the per participant here, the lady here says, well, I went to work yesterday. So we know that work is stressful for many people um, in just it, many adults in the workspace. Um, but for BIPOC psychologists, a lot of times they're added stressors. So the objectives today will focus on three different groups that may perpetuate racism and discrimination against BIPOC psychologists in the workplace. Um, but be sure that we are not trying to say that BIPOC psychologists aren't having wonderful relationships as well with different groups and having great experiences. We'll also highlight um, three mental health, at least three mental and physical health consequences of workplace, workplace discrimination and identify three coping strategies in addition to self-care. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide here is from APA and it really highlights that in terms of diversity in our workforce, um, we don't have great representation from BIPOC psychologists. So if you look at the um, top row, you'll see that the US workforce is 5% for psychology, um, is 5% Asian, 4% Black, and 5% Hispanic. And these numbers aren't that different from what I've seen 10 years ago. I think it increased slightly for Asians and Hispanics, 1% um, other and 86% um, white. Um, if you go down to where it says early career psychologists, that's actually pretty interesting because you'll see there's more diversity within the group of early career psychologists. So um, Asians um, went down from five to 4%, but you'll see that 
Um, Blacks or African Americans went up um, to 11%. And Latinx or Hispanic or Latino or Latina, however you'd like to use the phrase, um, went up to 17%. So there's increasing diversity and an increasing need for our field to really think about how we are um, structuring our work to better support diverse um, psychologists. So next slide, please. And here, this is, I'm sure, just a reminder for our participants about the importance of intersectionality. Um, a lot of the articles sometimes don't, that we will be reviewing, so sometimes don't stress intersectionality as much. Um, so we wanted to highlight that at the beginning. So um, our BIPOC psychologists that we're referring to have so much diversity in terms of their identities. There may be diversity in terms of religion, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, country of origin, language, disability status, veteran or military status, and a whole bunch of other identities that may be very salient and important to individuals and impact the ways in which they experience discrimination in the workplace. Um, and so those are important considerations. And next slide, please. And so three groups that we do want to highlight um, that may perpetuate racism and discrimination against BIPOC psychologists and make it very difficult um, are also groups that make work uh, meaningful and also joyful. Um, so when you have good experiences with these categories, so you'll see that clients and families, we come into this field because we care and we want to help clients and families. And for the most part, we have great experiences, but there are times where there may be experiences of discrimination or racism um, felt from a, by a BIPOC psychologist. Um, coworkers and supervisees, you can argue that these could be um, separated into two groups, but we put them in one group just because it's usually lumped into our role. So if we're supervising staff or trainees, it's our general role, but we may be having pushback that has to do with our race or ethnicity that's a challenge. And then supervisors and managers may also be perpetuating racism or discrimination. And the important thing to really think about is that there are times when a BIPOC psychologist may find themselves in a situation where they are experiencing racism and discrimination from clients and families, as well as coworkers and supervisors and managers and supervisors. So if you're experiencing it from those three areas, that can be very stressful without a lot of support. So next slide, please. Oops. Um, so this table, I know it's got a lot of information here, but it just highlights a few different articles. Um, as you all may be aware, there's not a lot written in this area. Um, but the, on the left hand side, this article um, by Pedrodi and Burns in 2016 focused on um, early career psychologists and really focusing on um, um, diverse um, psychologists, especially people of color. Um, as well as the LGBT um, psychologists. And then the other article, the other side, um, the right-hand column um, has articles, um, two articles looking at healthcare professionals, physicians, nurses, and other professionals. And so we'll focus on the left-hand side and just really highlight um, some of the challenges that um, were brought up in this article for psychologists. And there's some similarities for other healthcare professionals that I'll close out this slide with. Um, so the first one is just, Experiences of anxiety about self-efficacy and performing duties related to discrimination and racism from clients, supervisees, and coworkers. So early career psychologists oftentimes in general um, have some challenges with their own sense of self-efficacy, whether they're BIPOC or not. And so that additional sense of um, anxiety and stress and doubting themselves makes it a challenge as well. Decreased workload from clients um, harboring racist views who do not want to meet with psychologists of colors. So this is something that may not really be apparent to a system. Um, someone may have implicit biases or they may be more explicit about it, but um, it may not be something that you're really aware of in your space. Um, you may have some suspicions and maybe none of your coworkers really even think that it's an issue. Um, difficulty finding mentors and supports within work 
um, settings. Um, there's a lot that's been written about this. Um, and so sometimes it may be hard in different spaces to find some mentors and support, especially when you need those. And then experiencing micro invalidations and dismissing concerns from supervisors, program leaders, and coworkers. So many BIPOC psychologists who take a chance and share their experiences with others may be dismissed. May they may have a micro experience, a micro invalidation, and feel as if, hey, there's no support here when I brought up a concern that's important. This article really highlighted an important thing um, that I don't think we really think about. Um, the use of the doctor title, there are many ways in which um, people of color oftentimes have challenges from others recognizing that competency. So you may introduce yourself as Dr. So-and-so and that person addresses you by your first name. They may assume you're not the psychologist on the team. Um, and so some psychologists may cope with this by dressing in a very professional manner, making sure they, present, they say, hey, I'm Dr. So-and-so and using that title to make sure that they're given that credibility. Um, but they may also be dealing with other people who are like, well, call me by my first name. And that person may not be dealing with these experiences of discrimination. And so they may be perceived the bi -chi psychologist as being unapproachable. Um, and so that may, you know, decrease the connection with others um, because of that. But that was a coping strategy to deal with some experiences of discrimination or invalidation. And settings may be more individualistic. Um, rather than the collectivist culture that some BIPOC psychologists may come from. So those are just some important issues highlighted by that um, article that I don't think we often think about in terms of our programs and how to support psychologists. Um, if you look on the right hand side, like, um, other healthcare professionals are experiencing similar things. Um, so nurses and physicians also deal with racist assumptions by um, patients and colleagues. Um, name calling, calling and refusal of care by patients was really um, highlighted. And with the um, additional lack of confidence and doubting themselves, many reported worse work experiences or being held to higher standards and limitations of professional growth and lower wages, and also felt as if they were unable to voice concerns of discrimination and racism at work. And many um, complained about experiences of um, being mistaken for non-healthcare workers by patients or colleagues. For example, being assumed to be somebody who's working in maintenance, which is, you know, I, we love our maintenance um, colleagues. They're doing such important work, but we're not. If you're not a, a healthcare worker, it's if you are a healthcare worker, it's not appropriate for someone to just assume that you are um, a maintenance worker. Um, and then one of the things that was highlighted by the article by Philip. Um, um, Alvarez and Cardin um, 2020 is that the healthcare system really hasn't faced any significant challenges for failing to protect physicians and others from his, um, discriminatory practices, discriminatory practices um, from either patients or colleagues. And so there's more accountability that's needed. Um, next slide, please. And then many people may have heard of this term cultural tax. Um, and um, it's been coined by Padilla in 1994. Um, the other term you may have heard is minority tax, but that's really just to highlight that um, psychologists of color, professionals of color are oftentimes serving, providing a service to institutions in terms of being called on to address diversity and they're not getting the necessary benefits from it. So they may be providing a service to their institution as well as to patients of color, but sometimes they do not get the benefits. So increased service responsibilities related to diversity committees or initiatives. Um, may be something that provides meaning and purpose, but it may take away from other tasks that are more valued for evaluations and promotions. And when you think about taking on a leadership role, um, that should lead to more promotion, and oftentimes it doesn't for individuals. Um, being asked to care for um, clients of the same race or ethnicity, um, and we know that oftentimes Latinx um, psychologists or healthcare workers are often asked to do that um, in terms of the articles that were reviewed in the last slide. Um, but that may mean that they're not focusing on maybe a clinical area of expertise that they wanted to focus on because they're being asked just to focus on um, this racial ethnic diversity. Perhaps they wanna focus on PTSD or health or something other, but they're asked to be focused in this way. Um, and then another interesting thing that was highlighted is that 
facilitating or teaching um, diversity courses or seminars, sometimes it's challenging participants to look at things in a different way that's not as mainstream, which may lead actually to harsher evaluations um, where people may ask to seek a supervisor. And so there was kind of this um, kind of punishment in some ways that people experience. They're um, asked to bring about something that's important, but then they get a pushback. And we see that with um, physicians of color, um, they're experiencing the same things um, in terms of these um, responsibilities based on their um, racial or ethnic identity. So we want to just ask you if you'd like to um, put a question, put a response in the chat or maybe um, in the Q&A. What are some other examples of cultural tax that you've experienced professionally? Um, and once again, you can put it in the um, Q&A box or you can put it in the chat if that works for you. So we do see somebody who um, put that they had to use doctor in their Zoom screen as a coping mechanism. Um, so that's an important thing in terms of is somebody, somebody going to respond to you as doctor if it's there. I, I, um, was using a different account um, for a presentation recently and it had Dr. Mesidor and I kept being referred to as um, Marie and my colleague who was a white male psychologist kept being referred to by Dr. So-and-so. Um, we also have somebody who said um, being asked to translate because of Spanish language fluency and that's something that came about a lot in um, the articles um, on healthcare professionals. And so we know that the field has even really for a long time, I think probably close to 30 years has highlighted that um, there should be trained medical interpreters, right? So institutions need to, um, to be training, um, getting access to trained medical interpreters, to interpreters and not just relying on staff because there's an importance of that. And so that, that does add a burden and that is a cultural task and it's something that there is scholarship around and also um, information about why it's important to have trained medical interpreters. Um, all right, well, why don't we go to the next slide? Okay. So this um, article here on this slide, um, many of you may have seen it already, but it was a, uh, an article recently um, about trainee experiences of racism, sexism, heterosexism, and ableism at the um, VA. And the VA um, is actually one of the biggest, uh, one of the major trainers of psychologists in our in our country. I think I read that about 50% of psychologists have received training at the VA. Um, and so this is not to specifically target the VA, but this article was written by VA staff about their experiences. And I bet that there are similarities in other institutions as well. Um, what they did was that they had focus groups and they also sent out server surveys to former trainees. And this could include um, practicum students, psychology interns, as well as psychology postdocs. Um, the focus groups really highlighted experiences of sexual objectification, as well as um, sexism on the campuses, and so needing to do better. Um, and the surveys ask specifically about all of these experiences. And here I'm gonna highlight the experiences of um, racism um, that they've, they've mentioned. Um, so one of the things that the article did not have was uh, the demographic information of people who responded to either the surveys or the focus groups to create safety. They did not collect that information. Um, however, 89% of survey respondents reported experiencing or witnessing crude or offensive remarks related to ethnic or racial identity while on the VA campus at least once or very often. Um, and 69% of respondents reported that these experiences were moderately to extremely stressful, upsetting, or bothersome. So that's a pretty high number. And I, I think the, uh, the number of those people who were experiencing it directly themselves was in the, like the 50s. So that's still a lot. Um, and this quote here from one woman of color who put it in the survey, it's kind of, um, kind of captures what the other articles on the previous slide highlighted. So she says here, as a woman of color, I often struggle with balancing, asserting my needs with not wanting to be seen as the angry black woman. I believe in the moment of the isms, I want to assert myself, but was balancing expectations from others while in the professional roles. 
Um, so, you know, there's a lot of ways in which stereotypes still come into play in the workplace setting. So participants um, really struggled in with how to respond in a therapeutic way and were concerned about negative evaluations from staff and supervisors. So there wasn't that psychological safety that they could share their experiences and get support. Um, one of the um, respondents in, um, in this article said they just kind of felt like things would not change and things would stay the same. Um, the authors of this article really recommended that supervisors take a proactive role in addressing these issues and share with trainees how they have addressed such issues. So that means BIPOC psychologists having some vulnerability in sharing those experiences as well. But as we mentioned before, trainees may be a source of potential discrimination um, and it doesn't mean that a BIPOC trainee hasn't internalized um, racism and is not giving their supervisor the credibility. So there's a, still a lot of risk, but it's more important to address these issues. And of course, um, psychologists who are allies can really do a wonderful job by making sure that in the training programs um, that people are getting adequate support and that all psychologists are getting support for whatever um, type of experience they're, um, they're, ex uh, they're, they're having. So this article realized, really highlighted that not only is racism prevalent, but sexism and heterosexism and ableism, there are high rates of people responding to that they've witnessed or they've experienced those. Um, and so I'm going to go um, to the next slide. But I also do see another comment. Um, somebody wrote that they overlooked for promotions repeatedly despite positive reviews with derogatory racial stereotypes and in lieu of promotions or title changes. So that's an important thing. There's a lot of BIPOC psychologists who, you know, there's that cultural tax, they've been committed, they've been doing their part, but where's the benefit? And so institutions really do need to look at that in terms of who's getting promoted. Um, another ar um, article that focused on the experience of black male professionals in predominantly white organizations. Um, these were relatively young black male professionals. They were um, all um, under 40, um, but were excelling very highly in their fields. And you'll see similarities to the psychologists and the healthcare professionals. So many wrote that peers, um, many said it was focus group, excuse me, said that peers made less effort to relate to them personally than their white coworkers. Um, there was an assumption of inferiority and many said that they experienced shock from peers when they performed their job in a competent way, which was you know, kind of offensive to them. Um, or when somebody was able to see where they graduated from and thought, oh, wow, that's impressive. And so it was kind of felt like, oh, you went there, but it was it felt like they were, it was because they were a person of color. Um, they felt that different rules of performance, appearance, and behavior were applied to them, and there were stereotypes operating in the healthcare system. And there was also this sense, once again, that cultural task of failing that responsibility to perform well, um, as poor performance would reflect poorly on other Black employees or future Black um, employees. And so, um, meant one person specifically just highlighted that they felt that that was an undue burden, that they did not think that um, somebody who's in the majority um, racial group would feel um, necessarily that responsibility. Many doubted themselves as we talked about previously and questioned whether they were being too sensitive when they experienced micro regret, micro racial microaggressions. So there was a really a doubting of their own experiences and their own reality, wanting to be fair to others, but also knowing that something was off. Um, and there was this pressure to work harder than others and felt that their humanity was not valued as they felt judged by their race. Um, so that pressure to work harder and under a system of judgment and not feeling validated, um, there were a lot of costs, which included emotional distress, even if it was mild, anxiety and depression. And um, many felt as if they had to restrict their identity and their true self expression. So they couldn't be themselves. Um, John Henryism, I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, humor was used, compartmentalizing, avoiding certain topics for self-preservation. Um, one positive thing was that they were able to seek support through networks of um, co-ethnic peers and allies. So that was an important piece is in terms of forming some type of community, even if it wasn't necessarily in that specific work group, but within the institution. So um, next slide, please. And we see another comment. Um, somebody wrote, 
Um, being asked where you went to school, up, when you went to school upon first meeting, when they hear you are a doctor, they need constant validation that the doctor is legit, um, but white colleagues not being asked their school credentials. So those are um, similar experiences to that article. Um, so coping challenges can be an important thing to um, make sure that's being really considered. So um, African Americans um, in this article was really experiencing, similar to what the other um, article was saying, minimiz minimization of experiences of discrimination. Um, so um, one of the ways to do that for many was kind of increasing a sense of control or mastery. And some people may have heard of John Henryism, um, which was coined in the 70s by Dr. Sherman James, um, who is an uh, um, BIPOC epidemiologist, um, to really um, look at how um, people of color may work harder and try to control their environment. And for many, that leads to success. Um, however, um, John Henryism doesn't work when you don't have the right resources. And so um, early work with John Henryism really highlighted that um, people of lowest socioeconomic status really um, dealt with some challenges. But when we look at professionals of color um, experiencing John Henryism, um, that sense of control can still be harmful when they don't have the resources. So if you're experiencing racism or discrimination from colleagues, as well as supervisors or supervisees, um, and you don't have that support, working harder may not get you to, need to be. You might need to find ways to be more strategic. And John Henryism has been linked um, in the literature to cardiovascular health issues. Um, so for both African-American men and women, rumination was found to be a common response to racial discrimination. And as psychologists, we know that rumination is not um, something that's associated with greater health. It's usually associated with greater um, distress. Um, and so mindfulness was highlighted here as a protective factor. And so when we were talking about mindfulness, it's more of that um, state mindfulness rather than the trait mindfulness. So being in the present moment, being able to attend to what's going on in the present and not be in the past or the present all the, or the future all the time. Um, and there's definitely many ways to get to that mindfulness by different practices. And um, Dr. Camperetto will talk about that later. Um, so next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kempel Ritter. Thank you, Dr. Mesitor. Um, so I just want to quickly thank everybody for being here during the lunch hour and because um, we're both really excited to be able to um, share with you on this topic. So we just reviewed a whole bunch of different psychological, physiological, and of course, the way that all of this affects our advancement in our careers. And one of the things that I wanted to point out is as psychologists, we're already vulnerable to kind of um, stress. So we're already vulnerable. And as we talked about, um, we have like this intersectionality about who we are as a person, our personal histories, <clears throat> our spirituality, our current life circumstances, something like COVID, taking care of kids or family members going through a divorce or maybe getting married, moving, Right, and then there's also that whole piece of having our profession, like having a cultural devaluation of what we do. Many um, uh, medical organizations are really focusing more on how much, how much the number, the quantity versus the quality of, of what we can provide. And so um, little bit by little bit with psychologists we really start to become vulnerable. And then if you add this whole piece of being discriminated at work, Right, we're even, you know, with the what we've talked about with a bunch of different um, workplace indignities and microaggressions, we're more susceptible, more vulnerable um, as uh, Black, Indigenous, psychologists of color to these different effects of discrimination. APA, as you all know, like put out a um, puts out a, a stress in America. Uh, survey every single year. And in 2016, they actually did a, a report just specifically on discrimination. And in that report, not unlikely, um, uh, Black, um, Latinos, and uh, Native American uh, 
Alaska Natives had all reported that race was essentially the main reason that they had experienced discrimination. Um, at that time, um, two out of every five Black or African American men had reported being stopped for driving while Black, right? So what does that mean? They would end up with um, police searching them, questioning them, um, physically harming them. Obviously, if we were to look at this now, I would imagine that those numbers might even be higher. And so the other piece in um, that 2016 report on discrimination was with the Latinx community, which I, I really found interesting because what they said was before they went to work, they had this heightened level of vigilance, right, a hypervigilance. And they were preparing what they would say to their coworkers or, or managers or supervisors when they would experience some kind of workplace discrimination. And so they would want to prepare it so that um, they, would, they would not be further discriminated against or like to avoid any more microaggressions and any possible retaliation, which I, I thought was really interesting. In 2020, um, the report really focused, the APA Stress in America report, much more focused on the pandemic and less on um, the discrimination effects. However, what they did note was that, that the numbers for African Americans were still, so African Americans were like 48%, Latinx were I believe at 43, Native Americans um, at 42, and Asians at 41% were still experiencing workplace um, types of discrimination. So um, this slide comes actually from a, um, a podcast called, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name, but it's in the references. <laughs> um, um, Life Kit, that's it, Life Kit, sorry. And uh, the reason that I, I really wanted to bring this up is, so I just said, we're already vulnerable. Um, within our profession and with all of our other stuff that's going on. And then if we start to think about our intersecting identities of, of race and uh, sexual orientation and gender identities and ableism and all of that other stuff. Um, when we look at these numbers, we could see that just in general, um, people of color, well, actually the US population, so 13% of our population is black or African American, 19% is Latino, 6% um, Asian, and the other was uh, multiracial um, or other uh, race or ethnicity. So if we're looking at the support staff and operations here, people who really help um, uh, professionals, we're real, the people of color are very well represented. As we move up the hierarchy, you can see all the way, if we go right into executive leadership, African-Americans are only represented 2%, Latinos 3%. Um, as we go up, professionals, that's where we would be as psychologists. And then we um, move up into managers and senior managers and executives, black and brown numbers, as you can see, all decrease the higher that you go up. Um, and so why did I do what, you know, why, you know, bring this up? Well, because if it's going to be that much harder already as psychologists to be vulnerable, and then you add in this piece, and then you add in um, experiencing some kind of workplace discrimination, these numbers can get even smaller. And so I just thought it was really important to, to show like where we're at in um, the United States. So with your comfort level, I'd love it if you would in the um, chat, just throw in what kind of experiences you've had with workplace indignities, or microaggressions, either that you've actually witnessed or that you've experienced yourself. And while people are typing, I will um, read a comment that I missed from earlier and just wanted to highlight, I'm not reading people's names just because we're being recorded and um, just to protect um, privacy. Um, but there was a comment earlier, um, somebody wrote, sometimes the biggest part of the struggle for me is even recognizing when the reason why I'm having a hard time is because there's a cultural racist component at play rather than me being ill-equipped to handle the situation. 
And I think that's really hard. It goes into that um, self-doubt that that article talked about for early career psychologists, but I don't think you have to be an early career psychologist to experience that self-doubt. And somebody else responded that, yes, that they um, also at their, uh, as a BIPOC psychologist, they were afraid to offer support um, or um, and their professional ex personal experience. So I think that's another important piece that if you are in a setting where it is hostile or disinvalidating, everybody may just be in their own corners on their own um, and offering support to one another. It may be hard to, who, to know who to trust um, and to see if that other person of color is a true ally or if there are any allies there at all. Um, and so let me see in terms of the question here on this slide in terms of what what are some examples of workplace indignities or microaggressions you have witnessed or experienced? We do have um, a comment from there. Um, so somebody responded being placed on diversity committees um, due to my skin color without expressing interest in these. So that experience of being voluntold um, without regard for if this is an area of competency or if you have time in your schedule or interest. Um, and let me see what else is there. Um, being told psychologists are not real doctors. Um, and so that definitely is an invalidating experience. I would uh, agree that, that many people may have those in their settings um, and um, it can feel invalidating. Um, if somebody's saying, hey, you're not a doctor, so I'm gonna call you by your first name, even though you have that title. Um, somebody else wrote, I haven't experienced this, but I've noticed that some people give colleagues who have accidents, accents, excuse me, a hard time over language stuff, claiming um, excessively that they can't understand them, making a derogatory remarks, remarks about immigrants, holding up a professional interaction until the colleague reveals their place of origin. So yes, that's definitely something that's come through and that the article uh, focusing on Physicians and nurses highlighted that even more. And even if we haven't experienced that ourselves, we probably, I know I've heard that personally, people saying these things about somebody because they have an accent. Um, and I'm like, I can understand them perfectly fine. And this has nothing to do with their competence or just being intrusive into somebody's background. Um, somebody Marie, else wrote- Marie, yeah. I'm gonna actually move on because um, in the interest of time, I wanted to just keep going with the, with the slides. Okay. There were just two more if you want to just, um, we can come back. They're going to get answered, actually. I really appreciate them. And I do see them. They're gonna, I'm actually going to be able to answer and respond to them as we go along because they're, okay. they're all awesome. represented. So, um, so thank you uh, because everyone who has responded because a lot of what you just um, shared is, is all borne out in all of the research and readings that we have, that we have seen. And the way that a lot of self-care comes about in, in taking care of ourselves is what you see here. Um, this is a, what we know really well as psychologists, what we're giving and educating our own clients with and, um, and what we as psychologists aren't the best at doing for ourselves uh, because we get so overwhelmed. We have that whole vulnerability. And then we also have the John Henryism that um, Dr. Mazadora had noted earlier and so we tend to just not focus on ourselves as much. And yet we also know, you know, using something like the beginner's mind is so important in um, kind of bringing in these, these strategies. And even more so than these strategies, um, this article by Sue Alzadi and Awad and a whole bunch of other people actually from 2019 really talked about something called micro-interventions, which I'm going to get at. So we know um, microaggressions come in three different types of categories. So micro insults, micro validations, and micro assaults. And so those micro assaults are the old fashioned racism uh, that we would experience and not so much in the workplace. The, the old fashioned racism, um, an example, I, when I was in uh, elementary and, and in junior high, people would often call, my, my name was um, N Lips because my lips are so rich and juicy. And so that was the nickname that I ended up with. So that would be a micro assault. 
in the workplace, what we see is more of micro insults and micro invalidations. And so here in this slide, you can see a whole bunch of those comments of being um, micro insults and micro invalidations. And so an insult, of course, is a behavior or a verbal comment that's really rude and demeans a person's identity or um, their background. And an invalidation is a verbal comment or behavior that completely excludes and um, denies a person's actual lived reality. Uh, and so as we're experiencing these things in, in the workplace, then um, oftentimes people are calling these, you know, micro insults or micro invalidations. And truly, because they're, uh, they're we're experiencing these in a constant and they're uh, constantly in, in the lives of a person of color or whatever intersecting identity might come into play, they're reminded um, of being having a second class status, they're a lifelong burden, um, and they're cumulative. So they're happening not just once or twice in the, in, in the workplace, it's happening outside of our workplace in other areas. Um, and they're really subtle forms of discrimination. Those insults and those invalidations are really subtle subtle forms of uh, discrimination. And so there has been uh, you know, debate now of, well, are these really microaggressions or is this abuse? Uh, thinking about the term unconscious bias, same thing. Um, are we giving it out when we're saying that it's a microaggression or an unconscious bias and uh, not really talking about the really lived experience for those um, black indigenous uh, psychologists of color or communities of color? So Ibram Kendi recently noted that those targeted by racist behavior of any sort are deeply impacted and the term microaggression serves to minimize the experience of those targeted. And I would agree. And I really think that we're probably gonna end up seeing this, these terms of micro um, change uh, in the future. So coming back, uh oh, hmm. Guys, it's a blank. Ah, okay. Sorry, I'm not sure why it's it went blank because there's more slides here. And I think it's just Murphy's Law. There's always something that's gonna go. So that was our oh. thing, and we'll move on from it. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so I'm going to close it out and then bring it back up. And I'm just going to try to keep talking and terrible multitasker. So you're going to see me here and I'm going to be over here trying to get it. <laughs> so I'll do my best. Uh, let's see. Nez, do you want me to try to share my screen? Um, I'm pulling it up right now again. So let's see okay. if it'll. Yeah, you try somebody. If it doesn't work, then I will try sharing my screen. Okay, so let me go here. <sighs> I think nowadays see. with presentations, we always have, there's always gonna be something, whether it's problems with bandwidth or something, um, most people can relate to that. Share my screen. There we go. Can you see that? Yep, it's up. Okay. Okay, so um, experiencing these subtle forms of uh, workplace discrimination in the forms of insults or um, invalidations creates a, obviously a hostile work environment and it can be a really invalidating place. And so really what occurs is, is like a subtle form of exclusion that, uh, that occurs. And that could be like, um, you, you were part of a conversation or you initiated something and then all of a sudden you're not considered a stakeholder anymore and you're left out of the conversation or the meeting or whatever's going on. Um, you were a position um, for a promotion or a position for an opportunity um, is, is only, uh, given to a certain amount of people and you're, you're excluded about, you know, from that um, uh, promotion or opportunity and then you find out later about it. So little bit by little bit, we start to experience this, these like subtle places where we're also being excluded. When we think about the um, 
physiological and psychological effects um, that we talked about earlier. There's the, the two that I didn't highlight there and that were more highlighted in this article were the freeze effect and the silencing. And the freeze effect, when we think about the, free, the fight, flight, freeze, right? And trauma, that means that we perceive that there is no hope for survival. There's no way that I'm going to outrun or outfight whatever it is that I'm being threatened by. Well, it's the same thing with um, having that, it's very similar to having that freeze effect when we're experiencing um, an insult or an invalidation or an aggression. So we are so bewildered and astonished that a, you know, a psychologist of color might not even know how to respond or even find the language and the inability to respond. And so that freeze effect moves us, us into, as we all know, the ruminations, right? Same thing with trauma. We start to think about it. What should I say? Was it, you know, was it me? And we start to second guess ourselves. And um, maybe it is me. Um, we feel like we can't really disclose what just happened because what if somebody thinks that, you know, I'm a problem child or, or I'm being too sensitive. Um, and we can't, and we, might not even go to those, I think Maria, you had said this earlier to um, our colleagues of color as well, like because we're feeling so ashamed that, and we just you know, want to avoid anything to make us feel worse, like we're afraid of, of feeling worse. And so we silence ourselves. And that is really, I think the worst part and very similar again to the, the trauma experience where we silence ourselves because of the, the avoidance, the avoidance, right? And now we're isolated and alone. This article talks about micro interventions um, beyond what we just saw about, you know, self-care strategies, right? So these micro interventions are um, behaviors, right? Words that we're actually communicating and validating a person's experience, um, who they are, reaffirming their uh, racial or their intersecting identities. And we're also saying, you're not alone, I got you. Right? So two wonderful things about micro interventions is um, it helps enhance our psychological well-being. Why? Because we have a sense of self-efficacy, we have a sense of control. And then two, um, it is that we're starting to build a repertoire of responses to kind of de-escalate de or you know, point out these insults and um, uh, um, invalidations. Um, and Micro interventions are very interpersonal. So uh, you kind of, just like when we're doing therapy, like we come into our own identity and our style and how we you know, speak and talk. It's the same thing with using these micro interventions. It's like we come into our own, we bring in our whole self and it's kind of like an art form in how we end up using these um, interventions. So in the article, it talks about um, micro interventions within interpersonally within an organization or institution and then um, in a societal aspect. And for the interest of time, I'm just gonna go through the interpersonal ones. I do have a slide um, on the, on the um, uh, institutional uh, uh, microaggressions, I'm sorry, uh, micro interventions. And I'll show those to you, but like I said, in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna go and uh, pass that. And you can read that, of course, and I do um, recommend this article, which is in our references. So the um, four areas or the four ways we can use a micro-intervention interpersonally is to make the invisible visible, to disarm um, to the micro-aggression, to educate the offender, and um, to provide a, get external intervention or support. So one of the key things about using these uh, micro-interventions is to really be cognizant of the context. So we wanna be aware of the relationship and who you're connecting with. So is it a family member? Is it a stranger? Is it a coworker? Is it a friend? Is there a large power differential, my manager or their manager? Um, um, is this in a private setting or a public setting? Um, so all of those things will help you choose whether you a micro-intervention you want to participate in or not. So context is really important for these. So for the making the invisible visible, this is a very subtle way to respond. Um, and again, like it, it's like an art form. So you know, privilege for people can make it really difficult for ourselves to catch the bias or the prejudice that's really underlying a statement. So if a supervisor says to an Asian trainee, how oh, your English is really good, 
than um, the response to kind of bring about the problematic attitude of that supervisor would be something like, thank you, I hope so, I was born here. Um, another way might be if a manager to an employee says, you know what, you're being really overly sensitive about this. And so um, you can respond with, so are you saying that um, I am wrong? Like somebody that is sensitive is wrong? Is that, is that what I'm understanding? So again, bringing, bringing about you know, the problematic attitude or in this example here, a coworker saying to a Muslim coworker, you don't speak Arabic? And the response being, why would I speak Arabic? So um, again, you could see like how it's an art form, like you wanna bring yourself into this. The next one is called disarming and it's much more direct um, and in addressing the, uh, the aggression that, that you're experiencing. So this is where a coworker to a coworker talking about a psychologist that just got promoted might say, um, you know what, they only got that promotion because they're a psychologist of color. And so the other coworker could respond, you know, I don't agree with you. I actually believe this person got it because, and then we would talk about all of the skills, right? Um, another example could be um, a, a new, brand new transgender employee starts to work with you and, and a coworker says to this transgender employee, so do you date men or women? And so the response would be in a disarming response, you know, while I can understand that you're curious, I'm going to ask that you respect my privacy and not ask such offensive questions. So that would be a disarming kind of comment. Educating the offender. So here, uh, what you really wanna do is promote empathy and um, really speak and appeal to the offender's values and principles. Oftentimes what happens is the conversation from the offenders, well, I really didn't mean to say it that way. Like that wasn't my intention. And so what occurs is um, the, the focus goes back to them and it is lost on the impact that it actually had on the person who experienced that abuse or that, uh, that aggression. So always bringing back the conversation to the impact that it made on the person. So in an example, manager to manager, I know you have to follow directives, but what you said to Avery was offensive and hurtful. So, and then the last one is external interventions or support. So calling in your reinforcements or seeking help from institutional authority. So this is calling in on those people that you trust, um, get their unjudged, you know, no judgment, get their unbiased perspective um, and, and get them to, to give you what they feedback that you think would be really helpful. And of course, we can always educate ourselves by going to those institutional authorities to get information on how, how the system works and where you have your rights and, and what you can do. And so that's the institutional strategies that, that, that I just um, had expressed. So the, it, it again goes through all four of them and gives, and you can read these, they're really pretty self-explanatory. What I'd really like to go into is um, this uh, also came from a podcast, um, also came from um, Life Kit, and the two podcast uh, hosts actually spoke to Alan Henry, who is the service editor for Wired. This is a great, really great podcast. So um, here are some more kind of like rethinking how we're, how we're going to be coping with. Um, these workplace discriminations. Okay, so the first one was keeping a diary of your accomplishments and your daily duties. Wow, I see that we've only got like six minutes left, so I'm gonna try, and so I apologize for this. So this is just about um, sitting down with yourself either weekly or daily and noticing your accomplishments. And not just like writing down what you did, but really thinking about, Wow, how does this? How did what I did this week really fit into my overall career goals, the goals of my team, of my program or organization? While I was doing these things, um, was I treated fairly? Uh, did I feel supported and encouraged? Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that would be an accomplishment. Daily duties, I totally love because what this is is it, more than just you know listing stuff. The author talks about office housework versus um, glamour work. Office housework is what is considered to be like 
booking a meeting room, taking minutes, making sure the equipment's all working properly, right? All of those things that make your team and everything kind of run, right? Versus um, the daily duties of doing glamour work. So those are the things that leadership is actually going to notice. Um, you write up some guidelines, you are asked to lead meetings, you, um, I don't know, the, those are the things that, you, that would get us noticed. So those are the considered the glamour work. So keeping note of what is the, the, the office housework versus the glamour work. Managing your boss, this is also a great one. So this is making sure that what you agree um, to do is aligns with your manager's priorities as well as yours and those of your team. So uh, it's really easy to get caught up in doing something because even though it's not part of your job description, like the, let's say the, the office housework, because we just want to be, we want to be looked upon as, as a team player, right? And so we're going to just easily do it. Well, the way that we can manage the boss or um, manage up is to say, hey, I noticed that um, Marie has, you know, led this uh, meeting for us, you know, three times. And so uh, I'm hoping that we could rotate this responsibility and then I could lead the next three meetings, right? So that would be managing the boss. Employee resource groups is um, what Avapal has beautifully done here. Um, so I'm going to speak to two that I have been involved with, which is the Psychologist of Color um, Special Interest Group and then um, the Telemental Health Special Interest Group. What are these employee resource groups? They are places where you come together with your own community, where you can actually talk about those workplace discriminations that you are experiencing, the microaggressions, um, you know, getting feedback from each other, how to support each other, resources that each, that each of you might have. And the beautiful part about the employer resource group and, and the way that uh, um, it was talked about in the podcast is that the leaders are already in there, right? The leaders um, in so many different areas are already in those research and those uh, employee interest groups and, or employee resource groups. And so um, when the management supports them, they're going to be able to retain people and to keep people in um, in the organization. Um, so the, the last one is called uh, know when it's time to go. So this is really key. Um, no matter what you've done or how much you've you know, um, tried to help or advocate or change things or um, nothing has changed or things are status quo in your organization or your department or your team and you're still in the same position. So you're not getting promoted. Well, writing is on the wall, go, right? There's another hospital that's gonna welcome you and that's gonna love the skills and the talent that you bring and the energy that you have and they're gonna support you so that you do advance. So uh, self-care. So some more about, um, you know, we've been talking about these, these untraditional ways of really, of really advocating for ourselves um, that gives us more power and self-efficacy. Well, if there's one thing that I'm going to say that I want you to remember is the, abil is, is the ability to, to build coalitions, to build relationships. So research actually does tell us that when um, a Black Indigenous person of color really is, uh, you know, gets social support from others, right? Then, then they're going to feel less isolated. They're going to have more self-confidence. They're going to have more, you know, psychological well-being. They're going to have, you know, a better satisfaction with the work that you're doing, even though it could be stressful and difficult. And if you're communicating with those people, you're also going to end up having opportunities to advance your career. They're just going to show up. And so, for me, I'm I'm really blessed because not only do I have this opportunity to do it with the psychologists of color. I have in my own VA um, a group that I meet with um, monthly where we are there to nurture each other uh, and support each other in, 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 our, in our work and the work that we're doing around us. So, gosh, so I talk so fast. I know I have no idea what comments said because I can't multitask. I apologize. I do want to thank everybody for being here again on behalf of me and Marie. Thank you, Gail and Division 18, for uplifting us. Um, this means a whole lot to us. And yeah, I don't know if you all have anything else to add. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Campo Verde and Dr. Mesador. We could talk about these issues obviously all day long. So kudos to both of you for trying to squish it into mm -hmm. a, a short, less than an hour long uh, webinar. We know people have to drop off. Just a reminder, I did put the CEU information into the chat box. If you are a Division 18 member, then you can get a one CEU uh, free of charge. If you are not a Division 18 member, we'd love for you to join us, but in case you decide not to, it's only $15. Um, this webinar recording and the slides from our fabulous presenters will be uploaded to the VA section webinar page in Oh, probably three or four days. So take a look. I know um, some of you might want to share it with some of your other psychologists of color colleagues. So we're going to end on that note. Thank you so much, Marie and Inez. Fabulous job as usual. And hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much for coming. Thank Bye, everybody. you, everybody. Have a great one. <laughs> I'll leave, I'll leave the um, chat, the meeting open for a little bit because it looks like some folks are wanting to get in touch with you all. I and I did respond. I responded to, to look at it. I did respond to the person who asked about us presenting at another time with my email and said, I'll discuss it with both of you. Um, I don't know if there was another one. Can I, you know, yeah, I'd love to have an opportunity to read through the chat. Were there any questions or anything?